Hello and welcome to Metabolic Entanglement. This is the second episode of the series on Metabolic Syndrome. In the first one, we did a general description of the syndrome. So, if you miss it and if you want to more know about it, you can check the link on the top corner of your screen. But now we have the task to explain what causes metabolic syndrome. Just for continuity, I will remind you that metabolic syndrome is a vicious circle between chronically high insulin and insulin resistance. The circle is vicious because chronically high insulin makes our body resistant to insulin, and insulin resistance forces our body to produce more insulin all the time. That way, the more insulin we make, the more resistant we become, and the more resistant we are, the higher our insulin goes. This vicious circle is the cause of metabolic syndrome and leads to type 2 diabetes and all other diseases that follow. But this is just the problem number one. Problem number two is that there is no cure or medicine for insulin resistance. And the only thing you can do is to choose the correct diet that will lower your insulin and restore your insulin sensitivity. And if we had just those two problems, it would be very easy. I would simply tell you, follow this diet for such a long time and it's done. But we are all different. We have different genes, we are at different ages and we react differently to different foods and drinks. That's why there is no one-size-fits-all solution and the correct diet may be different for different people. So, in the case of insulin resistance, just to be told that a certain diet is good for you is not enough. Of course, you can look for a specialist to help you, but as we already said, they are rare, and also this specialist won't be with you all day long and to tell you what to do on every step. That's why the best thing you can do is to become your own specialist. Because when you know exactly what the problem is and why you have a problem, you will know what to do. So, to understand why we are entangled in this vicious circle, we need to know what is insulin and what is insulin resistance. And to understand them, we need to know how our body uses and stores energy. When I started making this video, I was planning to make just one big episode that covers everything related to our energy metabolism. But at some point, I realized that this topic is so large and so complicated that it will take me long hours to tell everything at once. That's why I decided to break it down into smaller parts. So in this video we will start the topic of energy metabolism and we will find the answers to a few important questions. What is metabolism? What is the difference between metabolism and energy metabolism? Why we use our energy the way we use it? And how exactly does that energy look like? So, if you're ready, take a deep breath and let's dive in. What is metabolism? Things that are not alive have no metabolism and the reactions there are just chemical reactions. But all chemical processes that take place in a living creature are called biochemical. And the bundle of all biochemical processes that take place in a living being is its metabolism. So, in other words, what we call life, our scientists call metabolism. I still wonder why they decided to invent a new name, but we will let that one slide and we will call it metabolism for now. Every single thing that happens in our body is a part of our metabolism. We build stuff, we break down stuff, we transform some stuff into other stuff, we breathe, we move, we think, we feel, generally speaking, we live. And until we are alive, we have metabolism because things are always changing inside us. So, we can look at our metabolism as a sequence of constant changes that take place inside us. But in our corner of the universe, to change something, you must have energy. So, when we talk about energy metabolism, we are talking about the part of our metabolism 
that deals with the transformation of food into energy. All processes in our body require energy, and the more processes take place inside us, the more energy we use. Therefore, when someone tells you they have a fast or slow metabolism, they are usually talking about the fact that for a certain period of time, they use a certain amount of energy for all biochemical processes that keep us alive and kicking. Life on Earth, or if you prefer metabolism, began almost 4 billion years ago, and we, Homo sapiens, have existed as a species only for 50,000 years, and that is less than 1% of the time during which metabolism evolved. So the rules that govern our metabolism are established long before we appear on the stage of life. That's why to learn how our energy metabolism works we need to go back in time. And we have to go way back, way way back ago. We have to go into the age where life evolved from single cell organisms into a multicellular organisms. Because here we will find the reasons why our energy metabolism works the way it does. Let's take a look at one single cell organism. It is just a single cell, let's call him Joe. Well, if Joe needs energy, then Joe must eat some food from his surroundings and turn it into energy and the food must be close by because Joe is stationary, it has no legs. So far so good, but one day Joe and Mary decided to marry, and they became one body made of two cells. So now, as a multicellular organism, they start to work and live together, but two things haven't changed. First, if Joe and Mary need energy, they must eat and convert their food into energy separately. And second, that food still must be close by so they can eat it. All multicellular organisms work that way. Each cell produces energy for its own needs and every organism has a way to transport food close to all the cells. Those two evolutionary requirements determine the way our energy metabolism works. Ok, now let's go back to Joe and Mary and see what kind of energy they use. Let's take a look at Joe. Joe is a typical cell and it's not very big. Actually, Joe is the nucleus of the cell where the DNA is and the cell is his home. Joe uses energy in a form of rechargeable biochemical batteries called ATP. The full name of the molecule is adenosine triphosphate. And I mention it just because it plays a role in the way those batteries are recharged. Adenosine 3-phosphate is a molecule that has attached 3-phosphate groups and the bonds that hold those groups contain the energy. So when John needs some energy, it breaks down one of the bonds. As a result, he is left with some energy, one separated phosphate group and a new molecule called ADP, adenosine diphosphate. D because it has two phosphate groups. Then Joe puts the used battery into his charging device where a phosphate group is attached back and ADP is converted into ATP again. Joe recharges his batteries very often because he is always very busy and uses a lot of energy. And if we gather all the ATP our cells use for just one day, we will see that the ATP mass will be approximately equal to our body mass. It is estimated that a normal sized person uses between 100 and 150 pounds of ATP a day. So those ATP batteries are big, they take a lot of space, and Joy is tiny, doesn't have so much space for batteries. That's why every ATP molecule is recharged more than 1000 times a day. And that means that Joe is recharging ATP all the time. In fact, our cells can store ATP for just 6 seconds ahead. And if the cell stops making ATP, it will quickly run out of energy and die. 
This is how some poisons like cyanide work. They stop the ATP production chain in the cells and that comes in less than a minute. So Joe recharges ATP all the time and his charging device runs on full. This charger is the famous mitochondria, with which we were tortured in biology class when we were in school. But we will talk about it later, because for now we just need to know that mitochondria is the place where we make energy from food. Now back to the cells. As we already said, Joe can't afford to run out of energy. That's why Joe keeps food in his home all the time. But Joe's home is not very big. There are many other things in there, and there is not much room for food. That's why Joe needs constant and regulated food delivery. Not too little and not too much. Because if it is too little, Joe won't have energy to do his job. And if it is too much, his tiny home will be packed with food and Joe again won't be able to work properly. And here we have to ask ourselves a question. How close should the food be to a cell? so that cell can eat it. But to answer this question, we first must recall what diffusion was, because our cells receive nutrients on the principle of diffusion. Diffusion, explained into a normal language, means mixing of the particles of different substances. Gases and liquids mix easily with each other. That way smells are carried in the air, and milk is mixing with your coffee. The most important feature of diffusion is that when particles are mixing, they tend to distribute evenly in space. If you do yourself an experiment and add milk to your coffee, you will see that after a while, your coffee will color evenly without having to stir it. This is because the particles of the substances move randomly and tend to distribute in a uniform concentration. We all know there is no life without water. Water is the medium in which diffusion occurs in every living organism. We are made of approximately 70-75% water. Our cells are filled with water and are also surrounded by water. Practically they are soaked. And because the water serves as a medium in which food and everything else is transported, it is called a nutrient medium. It is like a soup for our cells. Now let's go back to the cells and see how they eat their soup. Let's take a look at Mary this time. Mary is also a standard cell and has a house. And her house floats in the soup. But Mary's house, like all houses, has walls that separate the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell. So when Mary uses food to make energy, the concentration of nutrients inside the cell decreases. And if the concentration of nutrients outside the cell is higher, then diffusion levels both concentrations by bringing new nutrients into the cell. Diffusion is a sort of a free transport. It is a gift from the universe for all living beings. Because in that way, the first single cell organisms didn't have to move, and the food was going into their mouths by itself. Which only proves my theory that laziness is the greatest driving force in this universe and that if you are lazy enough, the universe will find a way to feed you. But let's put all jokes aside and summarize what we need to take home from this video. The first thing we have to remember is that the cells have to produce their own energy and they cannot stop producing energy because they have a supply of ATP only for 6 seconds ahead. And because they are limited by their small size, the cells don't have much space to store nutrients, and they need a constant supply of food, not too little and not too much. Or more precisely, they need a controlled nutrient medium. And the last thing we have to take home is that the cells receive nutrients on the principle of diffusion. And diffusion is a passive transport and occurs only when the concentration of nutrients inside the cells is lower than the concentration of nutrients outside the cells. 
So that way the need of energy, the small size of the cells and the passive transport of nutrients determine the way we evolve. Because of these three requirements, we have variety of organs and systems. We have a bloodstream and lymphatic system that transport all the necessary substances. We have a brain that controls everything. We have kidneys that filter the blood and take out the trash. We have lungs that supply oxygen and liver that processes all nutrients. And we can store nutrients in our body to provide food for the cells all the time. Everything in our body is related to our energy metabolism because all cells use energy. And when our energy metabolism goes wrong, everything goes wrong. I know the information I'm giving you in the first episodes may seem unimportant, but please be patient because if you don't know the basics, you can figure out the more complex things. Disclaimers I'm not a doctor. The content is for informational purposes only and does not constitute medical or other professional advice. I don't work for a food or medical company and I do not receive funding from any industry. I don't like to use qualifiers like good, bad, healthy and unhealthy because they can be subjective, misleading and generalizing. I will try to keep my language as understandable as possible and at the risk of not being extremely correct I will try to explain biochemistry in layman's terms. That was all for now, thank you very much for your time and attention and if you are interested in the topics we discussed in this video you can find more information on the YouTube channel of Project Metabolic Entanglement. Thanks again and bye bye.